Okay, so a brief history of the BSD fast file system. Now, how many of you that wrote code 30 years ago still have that code running anywhere? All right, yeah, two of you. Yeah, if someone had told me that I'd be asked to stand up and talk about something that I wrote 30 years ago, I would have wondered what version of ACID you were on, but <laughs> probably window pane at that time. Anyway, uh, let me just launch into it. So the, actually, the earliest work that we did on file systems at Berkeley was in the late 70s. Uh, this is when we were still running the version 7 ver uh, Unix from AT&T. And at that time, they had the, the file system in which the three blocks were organized as a linked list. So you just, when you allocated a block, took the first thing off the list, and when you deleted a file, you put them onto the list. And one of the disk manufacturers described the disk layout that you got as the thin film effect. All the free blocks would sort of float to the surface, uh, and then you just sort of randomly pick blocks, because the, you just got a complete scrambled mess. So every seek was a long seek, on average halfway across the disk. And in those days, the platters were this big around, and a seek took a long time. And so the first thing that we did to make the thing work better was to go from using 512 byte blocks to 1K blocks. And they were still just as badly laid out, but there were only half as many of them, so you had half as many seeks for any given file size, and hence it went twice as fast. We went from using 2% of the disk bandwidth all the way to 4% of the disk bandwidth. Uh, but it pointed out the fact that this, you know, we, we were moving in the right direction. Bigger blocks, of course, would give you better throughput. Now, you could take this to a logical extreme and it'll just go to 8K blocks or something, but then that would mean that even the tiniest little file would take 8K, and in those days, that was not an acceptable thing to do because the disks were much smaller. So, although it gave us the, the performance improvement, we clearly had to do something else besides that. Now, the other thing was that the wasn't a very reliable file system. It would crash and then you'd come back up and you had to run these manual tools. There was iCheck, NCheck, and DCheck, and then you had this thing called ClearEye where you could zap an inode to say, well, that one's screwed up, so just get rid of it, and to sort of repatch the file system together. And so in order to avoid having to do that, we started staging the I.O. operations. Uh, so where you were updating critical metadata, we would do synchronous writes to ensure that things were done in an order in which the disk would be recoverable. Uh, it was only later that FSCK got created, which was really just sort of taking those three main tools or four main tools and, and sort of putting a little logic around them to clean things up initially. At any rate, uh, this was sort of an interesting thing to start doing, but it obviously wasn't going to be the end-all, be-all answer. So in 1982, uh, I ended up, for various reasons, needing a, uh, something to do over the summer, and the DARPA grant had just come in, and so I went down and talked to Bill, who was running that project at the time, since he had been my office mate, and uh, we had worked together on other projects like the Pascal compiler, and said, well, I need something to do for the summer, and so he says, oh, well, I've got this little design for a file system. Why don't you see what you can do with it? And uh, so by the end of the summer, I put it all together, and it was the, the fast file system design. And uh, the idea was to have hybrid block size and bitmaps. Uh, so you'd have a bitmap so you could look around and find blocks that were closer to each other instead of just getting whatever randomly happened to be at the front of the list. And then the idea that you could take the inode pointer and uh, point to zero or more full-size blocks and then a fragment which could be up to the eighth, one-eighth of the size of the full-size blocks. So first off the, the bench, we deployed it with a 4K block size and 512 fragment size. Uh, and of course, it was configurable when you would construct the file system. Uh, so when we talk about it, it's really just what the default is. You could have done 8K, 1K if you wanted to. Uh, but we just made the default 4K, 512. And that meant the smallest file still went on one sector. Uh, so that design is essentially still 
what the fast file system is today. Uh, the design that I had at the time uh, was that you had it sort of divided into two pieces. There was the implementation, which was the part that whacked on the bitmaps and you know, kept track of what was going on. And then above that was the policy routine. And what I learned fairly early on is if you're a file system designer, you have to have reliability. So people are willing to have machines crash and reboot all the time. I mean, the blue screen of death was well known. They'd do it two or three times a day and didn't seem to phase them much. But the one thing you couldn't do is when you came back, you couldn't have a curdled file system because that meant they had to go to their possibly non-existent backup tapes and spend a great deal of time getting things back again. So the file system had to be stable across crashes. And if you are, if you have the part that manages the bitmaps done correctly, then no matter how bad the policy routine is, it won't mess up the file system. So the, the policy asks for a block, and if it's available, the underlying thing will give it to you, and if it's not, it will give you something that's available nearby. And so there, you can put any harebrained policy you want in, and you're not gonna mess things up. But if you change the underlying implementation, you can potentially then curdle your file system. And so I got that right in 1982, and I have never changed it since. All that's changed is the policy routines over all time. And that turns out to have been a really good idea. There were a couple times when I said, oh, if I just tweak the way the implementation works a little bit, you know, I can make this better. And both times, when I started running tests, I curdled the file system. I was like, what was I thinking? Just leave it alone. Uh, and uh, you, know, you sort of see the, the, the sort of the flip side of this, there was riser FS, which early on curdled file systems, and it got a reputation as a file system that did that, and then, it, you know, even though he got it working, uh, it, it just never was able to throw off that sense that it would curdle file systems, and so people just, to this day, won't use it. In fact, the uh, snarky thing to say is, write a bad file system, go to jail, but we won't go down that path. Okay. So, in, the, in 1982, the way disks worked were you were very aware of how the, the disk was organized. Uh, you had to be, in fact, because when you wanted a block, you had to calculate which cylinder it was in, which is to say where you should seek to, and so you would issue a seek to the disk, and then you would get a, an interrupt back saying, okay, I'm on that cylinder now, and then you would have to figure out which platter and what rotational position it was on that platter. And in fact, there was a rotational position register uh, that would tell you, you know, where it is rotational, where the head is rotationally now, and you'd say, all right, you know, pick up the thing that's three blocks ahead on this platter. Uh, so you, you had to know all that stuff. And furthermore, it meant that you could use that to do an improved layout. So you could, for example, say, okay, well, the, you know, the next block isn't available on this platter, but if I go down three platters, there's one that's available just you know, one, one rotational delay or sector away. And so there were these rotational layout tables, and you could you know, do all these calculations to get something that was closest to where you were going to be when the seat came in. So uh, by 1986, they had sort of abstracted that away, and so you started just having logical blocks on disk. You just say, get me this logical block, and it would just go get it. Uh, so we actually, in 86, got rid of all of the disk geometry calculations and just went to logical blocks. So the assumption was if it was logically close, then it would be quick to, quicker to get to than one that was not logically close. Uh, that's not strictly true, but it's mostly true. Uh, we still talk about cylinder groups, and that came from that early day when there actually were cylinder groups. Today, when we talk about a cylinder group, it's just a chunk of blocks that are in a, you know, close together. So you know, we just take the first n blocks on the disk, and then the next two n or the third three n, and so on. And it, each cylinder group is like a little mini file system. It's got its own bitmap and inodes and other things, uh, and so it allows us to do clustering more easily. Then in 1987, um, we went to file system stacking. Uh, and the idea here was uh, to allow these different modules to be stacked on top of each other so that you didn't have, for example, you know, NFS happen to know exactly what was the, the file system that was underneath it. 
Uh, so in this little picture here, uh, we've got uh, the, the stack here. So the bottom of the stack is op not supported, and you're coming into the top of the stack, and each layer can pick off and service a, a request, a, a VOP request. If it wants to, it can modify things and just pass it through down uh, below. Uh, and if it gets all the way to the bottom and, and nobody is, has done it, the op not support layer will just say, well, that operation's not supported. So you might have something like start and end transaction, and if there's no file system in the stack that will do start and end transaction, you'll just get op not supported coming back up. So here you can see we got the, the local file system, and then we put the, an NF server module on top of that, and for local machines that are using the same UID, GID mappings, uh, that just gets exported straight out. Uh, and then to some remote site that has different mappings, we put a UID, GID mapping layer here. And so something comes in, the only thing we do is change the, the credential essentially and then pass it down to the NFS server. Uh, and the point of this is that, you know, first of all, you only pay this mapping cost if you're actually using it. And so locally you don't have to, whereas here, you know, it's a, however complicated it needs to be. Uh, and all these things are just completely independent of each other. Uh, if it comes in here and it's not something that has a credential in it, we just do what's called a bypass and just pass it straight on through to the to layer underneath. And this allows you to do like the local loopback server and the union file system and all these other things, um, again, without having to interact. You know, you don't have to put code into UFS to deal with an NFS server or uh, loopback mount or whatever. So by 1988, disks had started getting bigger, uh, and so we changed the default block size uh, to 8K, 1K. Uh, this now means that small files use a minimum of two disk sectors, uh, doubled the throughput for the reasons I talked about earlier, and it really only wasted about 1.4% additional space. Uh, that was deemed to be a good trade-off because, you know, these disks had grown from, you know, 50 megabytes, they were now 330 megabytes with a big honking disk set, you know, for the size of a, well, I guess it was about an 8U uh, rack mount thing. Uh, at any rate, uh, we continued on, and in 1990, uh, the thing I added was this thing called dynamic block reallocation. And uh, up to this point, we had not had tag queuing, and so it didn't make sense to lay blocks out contiguously on a disk, because in particular, uh, if you were reading or if you were writing, you would write a block, and when the I.O. completed, you'd get an interrupt, and you'd say, well, what do you want next? And you'd say, well, I want the next block. Well, you had just missed it, and so you'd have an entire rotational delay to come around and get it, and then another rotational delay to get the next one, and so if there were eight blocks, then you'd have eight rotations to get eight blocks off. So you're much better off to lay them out every other block. Uh, and so you'd pick up one, and then during the time you were passing over the next one, you'd set up the next I.O. transfer. And this way, in two revolutions, you got all the blocks off of a track, or you could write all the blocks on a track. Well, we started getting disk caches, and at least for reading, that allowed you to do uh, contiguous reads, because it would just bring the track into the cache and then pull it out of the cache. Um, for writing, you needed tag queuing, because you don't want an acknowledgement of the fact that you have it in the volatile memory of cache on the disk, you really want to know that it's on the disk. Uh, and so with tag queuing, you can just say, all right, here's a whole bunch of things, just tell me when they get written, and then you can, when you get an acknowledgement back that that block is done, uh, you can proceed onward. So with that, it began, became reasonable to do contiguous block layouts. Uh, and so now the question is, uh, you know, how do we decide where to put things? Well, when a file is first open for writing, they, the user doesn't tell you how big it's going to be. They just say, I'm opening a file for writing, and then they start writing. And so the question is, where are you going to lay out blocks? And uh, we are allocating the blocks as they are getting written, and so we say, well, it might be big, so we should put it where we can have a big contiguous block, a set of blocks, but if we do that for every file, and most of them are small, pretty soon our big contiguous area of blocks becomes very fragmented, and you're kind of hosed because now you don't have any big contiguous spaces. 
So you say, well, I'm going to assume it's small. And you, know, I'll, I'll, you wrote one block, so here I have one block available. I'll put it here. And then it's like, well, then you write another block. And it's like, ooh, that didn't work so well. Um, so what we did is we said, well, we'll just, uh, when you write the second block, we'll, we got two blocks available over here. We'll just pick this one up and put it here and put the other one immediately following it. And then when you write the third one, then we go find a place where we have three and four and five and so on. And eventually, it becomes clear that it's going to be a giant file, and now we just start laying it out in an area that's contiguous. Well, if we actually were doing all these reads and writes, of course, that would be horrendous. But this stuff is sitting in the buffer cache, and we don't tend to write it until it's been in there for about 30 seconds or so. And so, in fact, all we're really doing is just changing some, some block pointers in, in buffer headers. We go, oh, we told you we're going to write it there. Well, when you get around to writing it, no, actually, we want you to write it here. Oh, no, actually, over here, oh, over there. And so by the time we actually go to do the I.O., it ends up landing in the right place. Now, there are times when it doesn't work out. You have something like a very slowly growing log file. Uh, and so it, you know, it takes several minutes to use the first block and then several more minutes for the next block. And in that case, you actually do end up reading it back in and writing it somewhere else. But it's a slowly growing file, so it's not a lot of extra overhead. And it does mean that your logs, even though they're written over a long period of time, still end up contiguous. So when you go to grep through them, it's very quick to access them. OK, so uh, next slide just sort of lays out how that works. And what's the long-term effect of this? Uh, any file system is good if you just create the file system and then start writing into it, which is the way a lot of benchmarks get done. What's interesting is how well the file system is laid out after say, two or three years of use. Well, how do you do figure that out? That takes a long time. So what ended up happening was some folks at Harvard in the late 80s um, took a, a trace of some of their uh, central server machines. And they, they noted every single write that was done. And this file added, you know, did a write of this sort at this point. This file then got deleted at this later time. And so they had this big, long set of traces over a three-year period. And so they could, in the space of, it took them about three days to run the simulation, but they'd create a new file system, and then they'd just fire this set of, of writes at it, and just go ch -ch 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 -ch, and see, you know, after cooking it for three years' worth of, of writes, what did the layout look like? And the answer is that uh, you, you, if you look at sort of how, how good the layout is, it starts out perfect, of course, and then it falls off fairly quickly and eventually flattens out. And prior to this being put in, and what most file systems of the era did, was you got about a 40% degradation after three years, actually after about two years. Um, and so it would, it would come down, and you'd get uh, sort of 60% of the throughput that you would have originally gotten. And this one, when they ran the test, it comes down to 15%, and then it just stays at 15%, more or less forever after that. So it turns out to be a huge win. Uh, it's a fairly trivial thing to do. It's about 50 lines of code. Uh, and so I figured, well, you know, here we, you know, it's simple to do, and uh, you know, it's shown to work, but as far as I know, at least of the overwriting file systems, nobody ever implemented it since then. Okay, so by the mid-90s, uh, we had large file performance, was about as good as it was going to get. We were getting around 90% of the bandwidth of the disk. And, uh, the, the thing that was killing us was small file I.O. Uh, and particularly with the advent of the web, there was a lot of small file stuff going on, uh, particularly writing these little files. And so the thing that was killing us is because we, the way we were keeping the file system consistent was with synchronous writes. And we had to do two synchronous writes for every file creation and two synchronous writes for every file deletion. And this meant that whatever the synchronous rate speed of your disk was, if you were lucky, you would get about 200 per second. So that meant you could create a maximum of 100 files per second or delete 100 files per second, uh, or some combination of that, too. And uh, this was just killing us. So there were lots of different approaches that were taken to dealing with this small file I.O. issue. Uh, and it all boils down to how do you keep your metadata consistent? And so I'll just sort of go through what the different choices were. Uh, what we had done was synchronous writes. Uh, at the time, ext2, which was the Linux file system, liked to tout how much faster they were than we were, 
but it was because they weren't doing synchronous writes. You could turn it on, but if you did, it went too slow, so everyone had it turned off. And uh, I used to refer to this as wrong answers delivered quickly or curdled file systems delivered quickly. Uh, they eventually realized they had to deal with it, and so by ext3, they had done uh, journaling or logging. At any rate, it's, the benefit is it's simple and effective. I mean, you just go through the code, and it's like, well, this has to happen, and then this has to happen, this has to happen. So you do this, and you do a synchronous write, and then you do that, and you do another synchronous write, and then you know, everything happens in the right order. Uh, and as I say, the drawback is that it, a lot of file creation or deletion uh, is slow. And it's slow recovery after crash, because you still have to run FSCK over all the metadata, which is about 6% of the disk. And with large file systems, that's painful. So the first thing that we looked at was non-volatile RAM. We figured, well, you know, clearly this is something that what file systems are going to need, so all machines are going to have non-volatile RAM. So we did a big implementation to assuming that you had non-volatile RAM on the machine, and then we sat back and waited, and non-volatile RAM didn't show up. Uh, it did, of course, on big file servers. Things like uh, NFS servers pretty much had to have it, but as it's something that you could just generally expect to find on machines. It just wasn't there. Uh, and a lot of it was because the way it was implemented was you needed batteries. And the problem with that was the batteries would go bad, and then your NVRAM would go bad, and then you'd curdle your file system. And it's like, but, but you forgot to change your battery. And it's like, no, no, that's not an excuse. So uh, we ultimately moved away from that. But the idea is you just do anything that's critical into the NVRAM, and then after crash, you just go through the NVRAM and do any operations that didn't get finished. Uh, so, nice idea, it's good in a niche situation, but you can't use it as a general solution. So the most common thing that got done was atomic updates, and this either falls into journaling or logging. Uh, the difference is that journaling is just tracking the metadata updates, so it keeps the file system consistent, but you can lose the data. Logging tracks both the metadata and the data, uh, and so everything that's gotten logged uh, up to the point that it's logged will be recoverable. Uh, so the benefit, of course, is that create and deletes don't slow down under heavy load. You have a fairly quick recovery after the crash because you just run through the logger journal. The drawbacks are you generate extra I.O. because everything gets written twice, nominally. I mean, there's ways of getting around it a little bit, but um, for the most part, um, you're writing things first to the journal and then to the file system. And it doesn't give you much speed up for light loads, not that it really matters, but it is just extra stuff that's going on. Okay, so this, the, it, the uh, logging or journaling is pretty much what most file systems use today. Uh, but, uh, of course, we had to do something different. Uh, another approach that got used was the copy-on-write file system. If you're not overwriting any of your metadata, then you know, it'll stay consistent. And so, initially at Berkeley, we did LFS, then of course there's ZFS and Waffle, which is the network appliance file system, and you know, others in this vein. Uh, first of all, the, the big benefits is the write throughput is really high, because you're just gathering a bunch of stuff together until you're ready to do a checkpoint, and then you go boom, and drop it all in one place. You don't have to run all over the disk to write metadata in little places. Uh, Snapshots are really easy to do because since you're not overwriting anything, unlike in the overwriting file systems like UFS where you got to do copy on write all the time. It's like, oh, they're updating something that we got to save and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's just like, yeah, we'll just keep that particular checkpoint. And uh, as long as we keep that checkpoint, we've got the, the snapshot. So taking a snapshot is not much more expensive than just taking a checkpoint, which you're doing all the time anyway. Uh, it's always consistent, since you're not overwriting, you're just moving from one consistent state to another. When you go, when you do a checkpoint, you move from this consistent state to the next consistent state. Uh, it does mean, though, that you still have to carry a, a log between the, the uh, checkpoints, because you can't implement F-sync by taking a checkpoint. That's just too, it's too high a cost to do that, so you have to have a log so that you can when someone does an app sync, you can say, right, I wrote that thing to the log, so now it's, it's safe to return from that. Uh, the drawbacks are the, the disk fragmentation. Uh, in particular, if you're writing a file slowly, it ends up just all over the disk. And so when you go to read it back, it can be slow. 
this leads to the need to have a lot more memory because you need to essentially be able to cache the stuff you're reading um, so you don't have to do a lot of disk I.O. for that. Um, so then finally we get soft updates. Um, the benefits are that most operations are going to run at memory speed because all we're really doing is keeping track of, well, this bit of metadata has to be written before that piece of metadata, and then we just make sure that things get written out in, the, in an order that's acceptable. So if we're writing a block and some of the things can't be done, we have to do a rollback on that, let the things that can be written be written, roll forward again, and it's locked during that time so people don't see the fact that we fiddled around with it. Um, it actually reduces the system I.O. because things that we used to have to do as single metadata updates now can just go black out all in one big block. Um, the file system is always consistent, so we have instant recovery after a crash, which is to say you can crash and reboot and crash and reboot and crash and reboot to your heart's content. This is content as you can be by crashing and rebooting constantly at any rate. Um, and so uh, the only thing that ends up happening is that you lose stuff. Uh, so you have blocks that you think are in use that actually aren't, inodes that you think are in use that actually aren't. So at some point, you need to run around and do a recovery where you recover those things that have gotten lost. So the drawbacks is, is wildly complex code. Um, and you need, a, at some point, you've got to actually do the reclaim. So we ended up doing background FSCK for that. Uh, and FSCK, when it's running in background, it can take you know, eight hours. It doesn't matter. It's just finding stuff that's lost. Um, but it's still putting an I.O. load on the system while it's running. Uh, and that's uh, annoying. Uh, and it has increased memory loading because you got all those uh, all little soft update blobs sitting around. Uh, today, the, the memory loading, which is about a, a quarter megabyte of memory on a typical file system, seems like a ridiculously tiny amount. But back when we did it in the 90s, that was like, a quarter megabyte you're going to use just for tracking file system stuff? That's insane. But uh, Moore's Law helps us there. OK. well. By the late 90s, we were starting to see snapshots coming in, certainly with the non-overwriting file system. So it was a feature that people wanted to have. Uh, it's to create a frozen in time copy of a file system. And of course, you want to minimize the time the file system is unavailable while you take a snapshot. And you want to minimize the amount of disk overhead to hold the snapshot. And you'd like to have multiple snapshots. Well, as I mentioned earlier, with the non-overwriting file systems, it's pretty trivial because you just take a checkpoint and hold on to the checkpoint. Uh, for us, it's much more of a pain because we actually have to essentially make an image of the, the disk and keep track of which blocks we are copied and are, yeah, which ones are copied. So when you modify something, we have to look at it and see if we need to make a copy of it. And so we really can't maintain more than about 20 snapshots for a given file system. Uh, it works, but if what you need is snapshots, you should just be running ZFS, in my opinion. Uh, in fact, if ZFS had been around at that point, I probably wouldn't have bothered implementing it. I would have just said, go use that one. So by 2001, the disks had gotten bigger again. Uh, so we raised the default block size to 16K blocks and 2K fragments. And uh, this meant now we were using a minimum of four sectors cost us about 3% extra uh, overhead. But again, disks were, they were starting to get now big enough that it was much less of an issue. They were also getting to be a lot cheaper than they had been earlier. Uh, so we'd put in uh, soft updates, uh, but at that time we didn't have any, the, the notion of a background FSCK. Uh, and so you had to periodically take your system down uh, and run FSCK. We used to actually keep track of how many times you'd had, uh, shall we say, unclean shutdowns. And after you had had 20 unclean shutdowns, we would force a, a FSCK to run uh, at that point to do the cleanup. Uh, people didn't like that because file systems were getting big enough that a FSCK could take an hour. And most people didn't want to have their systems offline for an hour, especially if it had crashed in the middle of the day. And we were going to say, oh, well, we'll just take from 1 to 2 in the afternoon. I think not. Uh, so at any rate, the idea of background FSCK uh, is to take advantage of what soft updates is doing and say, all right, well, there's the only inconsistencies we can have is blocks that are in use, marked in use, but they're free, and inodes that are marked in use, but are free. Uh, and so uh, you, can, you can come up immediately 
uh, and then just take a snapshot of the file system, and then FSCK runs over the snapshot, because FSCK thinks it's got a static, unchanging thing. But since all it's doing is finding stuff that you're never going to use until it finds it, uh, it doesn't matter that, you know, the system's been running and the file system's been changing. It eventually comes to a conclusion where it says, oh, well, here's a bunch of blocks that should have been marked free. Uh, so we added a, an IOCTL, uh, syscontrol, actually, that allows it to say, all right, these set of blocks are free. And so it goes in and under the usual file system locks, it puts them back into the bitmap, and then they can go off and be being used. Same thing for the inodes. So it all works out um, in the end. But it still takes the same hour to run, and it's still absolutely pounding on the disk while it's running, and so the rest of the system doesn't work terribly well. So again, this, this kind of thing works, but you know, today, if you've got a giant file system, you should just be using ZFS. I mean, that's what it's good at. And uh, where UFS is most effective today is in small embedded systems. And in a small embedded system, uh, you just run FSCK because it takes two minutes, and that's just that, and you're done. Uh, and so it's kind of pointless. But again, we didn't have ZFS at the time, and we needed to deal with these issues, and so that's what drove this happening. Uh, how do you actually do it? You just take a snapshot of the file system, you run the standard FSCK. I mean, I had to write FSCK, I didn't want to write another version of it, so just took that, and then all we had to do was change it at the very end, uh, which allows it to put things back. Okay, so by 2003, um, we were beginning to run into problems um, the, with, with file systems getting too big and not having enough bits in the block pointers to be able to deal with the disks that we had. The original file system that came in Unix in version 7 actually used 24-bit, 3-byte uh, block pointers. And so when I did the, the file system in 82, uh, I, when I did it, I said, well, you know, I don't like to deal with this packing and unpacking these 24-bit things, so I'm just going to use 32-bit block pointers. And Bill goes, like, oh, that's such a big waste, you know, that's crazy, why are you doing this? And, uh, you know, he had some argument about physics, how disks could never get bigger than a certain size because of something or other. And uh, I guess physics changed anyway. Uh, we sure started getting disks that were so big that we couldn't deal with it. So we realized that we needed to go to a bigger block pointer. And so while we were at it, we said, well, there's a bunch of other things we'd like to fix as well. Uh, and so we did a rev of the UFS uh, format on disk format. So we went from 128-byte uh, inodes to 256-byte inodes, which then allowed us to take all of our 32-bit block pointers and turn them into 64-bit block pointers. Uh, and while we were at it then, we also um, added some other things like the, the external attributes so that you could uh, essentially have file forks like you do in something like Apple's uh, file system. And we thought about you know, rewriting the thing from the ground up, but first of all, we wanted to continue being able to support those smaller file systems. Again, go back to embedded systems. They don't need 64-bit pointers. They, don't, you know, they have a relatively small amount of disk space. They still want to run on the old format. Uh, so there are many, many, many UFS file systems out there today that are still running on the old uh, format, and you can still I found a disk image from 82, and you can still work with that, read and write it, uh, although FSCK of the time will complain about you not maintaining the rotational layout tables properly, and it puts them all back in place for you. But uh, other than that, it, it works fine. So we said, all right, we're just going to take the existing one and you know, macroize the places where we're dealing with alternate formats uh, and so that we can just reuse the bulk of the code. So about 90% of the code is common between the two uh, file systems, just a couple uh, routines that have to do with allocation stuff uh, that are different. And what that meant was that it became stable and reliable pretty rapidly, and uh, it made it easy to continue supporting both the new and the old formats for more or less the foreseeable future, because you just fix something and it would just fix both of them. You didn't have to like fix it here and fix it there. Okay, so while we were there, we did the extended attributes, and 
the, as I say, the extended attribute is a, a bit of auxiliary data storage. There's actually just two direct block pointers, so 64K uh, if you're running with 32K blocks. And uh, in that, it's just a set of uh, things linked together, uh, uh, opaque objects linked together. So there's a, uh, the header of each one of them is uh, the count up to the beginning of the next one, uh, and then a type, which is either system or user, which says, is this something that the kernel's maintaining or that the user's maintaining, and then whatever they want it to be after that. So if it's a user one, you can you know, put little picture GIFs in there or whatever the random stuff you want to put in there. The system uses it to store things like uh, ACLs or uh, mandatory access uh, attributes or things of that sort. And because it's integrated into the inode, it means that when you update the inode, you are updating both the contents of the file and the extended attributes all in one I.O. operation. So the updates are atomic, the F syncs are atomic, uh, and so you get a lot of properties that you like uh, because of that. So 2004, you, you may notice this theme here. You know, you think you write some software and then you don't ever have to deal with it again. This is not the case. It's, it's like a job for life. Uh, back when I was first at the university, I, I didn't, hadn't quite cottoned onto this. So in 82, I did the file system, and in 84, I got involved in doing the, the NFS stuff, and in 88, I got involved in doing the VM stuff, and then people kept coming back and saying, oh, but, you know, this NFS thing, or oh, this, you know, virtual memory thing, or this file system thing, and so I quickly realized this was not a winning strategy. I was going to be, like, in perpetual fixing everything mode. Uh, so I managed to uh, pawn off NFS, well, I didn't actually pawn it off, because like, Rick Macklin was the person that actually did it originally, and I was just sort of integrating it. Uh, but I sort of made Rick in charge of that, and he's at this conference and still deals with it to this day. Did little minor things like NFS v4. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the difference in spec. Uh, the, the spec for NFS version 3 is, I think it's 35 pages. Uh, and if you look at the one for NFS v4, it just crossed 1,000 pages. In fact, someone asked me, well, so what's the difference between NFS v3 and v4? And I said, well, let me tell you the parts that's the same. They both start with N, F, and S in their name. <laughs> that's it. End of story. Okay. So, and then the, the BM I pawned off on uh, Alan Cox and others. So now I really only have to deal with the file system. And even there, I, you know, there's people like Jeff Roberson who've done, like, did the journaling stuff. Uh, and so... Even there, it, it, I don't really have to do too much. So I can just sort of sit back and say, well, you should do it this way, and then, you know, they ignore me and do something else. But, you know, it makes me feel better. Anyhow, uh, so in 2004, access control lists, uh, they uh, were originally the, the reason that we added extended attributes so we could put them in. It's just a specific list of users and groups that are permitted to access the file and the list of permissions that each user or group is given. Uh, they're... It's not rocket science, but it's you know, having that stuff in, sort of embedded in the attribute or in the inode just makes it much easier to, to manage it. So we had actually had ACLs earlier, but they, it was a separate auxiliary array. So there was a file, and there was you know, a fixed size thing for the ACL, and so you just index by the inode number, and then you would pick it out. The problem was, of course, it was fixed size, so you were limited to the amount of things that you could have in any given list, and you had to update that, and that was a separate I.O. operation, so the updates weren't atomic, and that would cause some problems at times. Uh, and so by putting it in the extended attribute, we just took care of all those problems. Then in 2005, we got mandatory access control. The, uh, there's a lot of people that aren't, you know, that are sort of stuck in their mind. Uh, what, what's the difference between uh, discretionary access control and mandatory access control? Discretionary is one where the user gets to decide what they want to do. So it's your file, and you can decide what, at, you know, who's allowed to look at it, and so on. Mandatory access control are things that are imposed by the system administrator from above. And even though some resource might be yours, it still falls under the guise of, of the controls that the, is being imposed from uh, the system administrator. 
This, of course, was originally done because it's the kind of thing that the military wants to have so that they can uh, label things. You know, this is secret and this is top secret and data can flow from secret to top secret but it can't flow back the other way and all this kind of thing. Um, but it turns out that there's a lot of other things that you can do. Um, so the MAC framework, for example, could allow you to impose policies like, for example, jails. Now, jails were done before this framework was in place, so it doesn't, t it uses a little of it, but for the most part it doesn't use it, um, but it could, you could implement the whole, all the jail policies through uh, mandatory access uh, framework. And really the, the key to it is just having a whole, someone going through the entire kernel and figuring out every place that some kind of a decision needs to be made and putting a call point there into the MAC framework. And so then the default MAC framework is just, the answer is yes, you can always do that, but if you want to impose some additional restrictions, then you can put in something that looks at it and says, oh no, you know, the, the stuff I'm storing on that file says it's top secret and you're trying to write it into this file that's secret, so no, we're not going to allow that to happen. Uh, so the point is that uh, the, the framework is there and there's actually a number of different uh, policies that have been implemented over time and those policies of course are loadable kernel modules and so you can load a particular framework and try it out and if it's not doing quite what you want then you can fix it and you know reload it the, the new framework and so on so it you, you don't have to like you know, reboot the system every time you want to change what the framework is um, none of the subsystems like the file systems codify how the, how the mandatory access control stuff is, is used. So the, the file system has a place, well, the extended attribute, where you can store these MAC labels. Um, and it just, it's just a thing that's stored of type sys. Um, it doesn't actually implement any of how that is, is enforced. It's only when you're going through the code, you call into the MAC framework, you pass in the, the label that's associated with the file, and, and it's the MAC framework that looks at that label and says, oh, this is top secret. Oh, this other one is secret, so no, you can't do that. Um, the file system itself is just a medium for storing and call points into the MAC framework. And that's true throughout the whole system. I mean, there's calls into the MAC framework from uh, all the socket stuff and device stuff, and you name it, it's there. So, in the, the mid-00s, the BSD, FreeBSD project had probably the single biggest challenge that ever faced it, and that was moving from a uniprocessor kernel to a multiprocessor kernel. Uh, open source projects are good at getting little individual things done, but something that has to encompass the entire kernel, crossing, you know, everybody, you know, all these different people's uh, domains of expertise, uh, and being able to impose some kind of a strategic plan on how you're going to get from a uniprocessor kernel to a multiprocessor kernel, uh, it was very trying. Uh, this went between uh, the, the four dot release and the five dot release, which unlike the nice schedule we're on now where you sort of can set your watch, oh, another two and a half years must be time for the next major release, uh, I think that one dragged out for, I don't even know, someone here probably knows, but four. Too long, yeah, way too long, Peter would know. Uh, at any rate, um, it is interesting to me that we actually did manage to do it. Um, I, I was kind of dubious, because you know, you start, well, it seems simple, right? We'll just put a giant lock over the whole kernel and then we'll just slowly replace things. Yeah, well, you get, you know, get UID and get PID and you know, the easy stuff gets done and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now we have to unlock the network stack. Well, that's, you know, hard to do. And there was a lot of debate about how it ought to be done, and in fact, somebody had to leave the project because they just couldn't get on board, they wanted to do it a different way. Uh, but it did happen, uh, and in the, in the case of the file system, uh, it started with the vNode interface, which got done in 2004, uh, and then the disk subsystem got done in 2005, and finally, the laggard file systems, uh, 2006, uh, got their bit done. And and then at that point, you know, it was SMP all the way through. So uh, it did happen. Uh, it was a painful thing, and I'm hoping that there's not another challenge of that scope uh, that the project faces in the future, because it's an even bigger project now. Uh, and it, it's really tough to coordinate a bunch of volunteers. Uh, it's bad enough trying to do it in a company. Volunteers, it's even more challenging. 
All right, so remember that, that uh, nasty problem with background FSCK, as it was used to say, people didn't like to run it. And so at one of these conferences, actually, in uh, 2008, uh, Jeff Robertson, who hates to travel but was willing to travel for that particular one, was at the conference. And people were whining about how long it took background FSCK to run. And so you know, Jeff says to me, well, you know, there's just like these couple things that you need to, to worry about. Uh, why don't you journal just those things? And then when you do a journal rollback, it'll be really lightweight because all you got to do is, you know, adjust a few block counts and inode pointer counts and you're done. And, you know, how hard could it be? Well, I'd, I'd sort of cottoned on to uh, the fact that as you get older, your ability to write code, it, you're you get better at writing code, but the number of hours you can spend doing it starts to fall, um, in part because you get tired quicker and in part because you have too many other interruptions in your life. And uh, so I, I had done very well in my 20s, and the, then in my 30s I'd been sort of running the CSRG and didn't get to do much coding, and I actually had a student come up to me when I was about 35 and say, well, now that you're completely over the hill and can't code anymore, what do you do? And uh, I took some comeuppance with this. So in my 40s, I did the, the uh, soft updates. And that was the sort of biggest and most complex piece of code that I had ever done at that point. And uh, I was able to do that. Now, I wasn't able to do 14-hour hacking sessions anymore. It was more like about eight. I mean, you could keep going, but it was kind of pointless because you just didn't make any sensible code. Uh, but you're also better at, you know, oh, I've been down that rat hole. I don't need to do that, you know. So you, you actually get more done for the time you're spending. Not 14 hours worth, but still. All right, well, so now, at this point, I'm in my 50s, and it's like, you know, I really like this idea of finding someone who's in their 20s to work with. And so I came up with a bunch of design data structures and passed them off to Jeff, and uh, he's in a different time zone than me, far enough away that, you know, he would be getting up about the time I would be giving up for the day. and. Uh, so I'd send him, you know, this stuff, and then the next morning I'd get up and there would be like a thousand lines of code. <laughs> like, oh, hmm. And I very quickly got in a thing where all I got to do was review code. Review code, review code, review code, and six months later, boom, out pop journal soft updates. Um, I might add that uh, the original file system was 1,200 lines of code. Um, it grew to about 4,000 lines of code. Uh, when soft updates got added, that added 6,000 lines of code. And journal soft updates added 8,000 lines of code. Uh, so it's, you know, at today somewhere around 20,000 lines, which I thought was insane um, until we started looking at other file systems. And so if you look at uh, you know, something, the, uh, was it XFS, the thing that got done at uh, uh, SGI, um, that file system is about 50,000 lines of code. And you know, ZFS, which of course encompasses far more functionality, is about a quarter million lines of code. So, you know, by those schemes, it's not that much uh, code, but it seemed like an insane amount to me. At any rate, uh, you only need to journal operations at Orphan Resources, so you need a journal that's about 16 megabytes, and that's independent of the file system size. It's really, uh, it's limited by how many operations you can do and how often you choose to take a checkpoint. So if you start to get the journal too full, you just, you, you know, take a checkpoint, but uh, just flush. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the upshot of, of this is we had to, of course, test the case where we ran out of space in the journal to make sure that that worked. And try as we might, we couldn't do that. And so we reduced the journal size. I think we had to go down to about half a megabyte before we were finally able to induce shortage. Um, and of course, the code didn't work properly, but we got that fixed. Uh, and then we put it back to 16 megabytes so we wouldn't exercise that code anymore. Um, the things that you need to, to journal are uh, free operations. So as you're, as you're freeing blocks or inodes, you have to put it in the journal until the, the bitmap gets written. Uh, link count changes, because those have to be correct. And the, the thing that really is annoying is unlinked while referenced. This is a wonderful semantic in the file system, a Unix file system, which is you can create a file uh, and then unlink it, and as long as you keep the file descriptor open, the file doesn't go away. It's not until the last reference is closed that you're finally able to take that file and, and free the space. And you'd say, well, who uses that? Well, it turns out demons use it all the time. They create a scratch file in slash temp, open it, and then remove it so that they don't have to clean it up later. 
And then they just keep it open as long as they run, which is typically until the system is shut down. And if the system crashes, you're left with this file that's allocated with no references. And so you, you, know, you need to, to clear that up or else you'll end up with all these unreferenced inodes and all the data blocks that they reference. And so the only way that we could figure out to do that was to keep a linked list to all these on-disk inodes with the head of the list being in the super block. And so then you have to you know, pick up the super block. If that is a non-empty list, you walk down the list of all those things. And as an exercise to the reader, try and figure out how you maintain a consistent linked list across blocks on a disk. It, it's a challenging set of IO steps that you need to go through to make sure that works. Okay. Well, by 2011, uh, it's time to raise the block size yet again. Uh, however, this time we are, are driven by the change of technology. Uh, disks for 30 years had been stuck at 512 byte sectors, which were absurdly small. And, uh, but none of the vendors wanted to go to bigger ones because you know, everybody had to do it at once. And I actually was talking to a Seagate person. I said, so what, you know, what was the thing that finally pushed you over? And he said, well, it was the fact that the, the, the market had been driven down to basically just two players. And uh, you know, one of us floated a trial balloon saying that we were going to you know, put out some 4K disks. And the other one immediately said they were going to do the same. And boom, and we were done. Went to 4K disks. Uh, and uh, it turns out that they were, you know, they were hitting one of those places where they you know, wanted to keep making the disks bigger, but they couldn't because uh, the technology the, the, technology of the actual media wasn't changing fast enough. But by going from 512 to 4K, they actually bought twice as much capacity from the same platter. Uh, and the reason for that is because the disk errors tend to come in runs or bursts. Uh, and so the CRC that you need needs to be big enough to be able to have however many bits of error that you have in that run uh, be, make that correctable. Uh, and it turns out that those runs are pretty rare. So you really only have to cope with one run in a 512 byte block. You only have to deal with one run in a 4K block. And so the number of CRC bits that you need for a 4K sector is n minusculely more than you need for a 512 byte sector. Uh, so the upshot is that they got rid of you know, seven sets of CRC bits. And so all those CRC bits essentially turned into data bits. And since the CRC is a significant fraction of the bits on the disk, boom, they got twice the capacity out of the disk by going to 4K. Um, they still pretend that they'll do 512, but don't think about doing that. That's just like, that is just asking to put a stake through your head uh, because the way they implement the 512 is they read the 4K in, they make the change to the 512 that you've asked for, and then they write it back out. And of course, you've just passed it, so you have a rotational delay while it comes around and rewrites the 4K sector. So if you write 512 uh, bytes at a time, it means new meaning to same day service. All right, so uh, now since we're going to 4K sectors, the obvious fragment size is 4K, so we'll go to 32K blocks, 4K fragments. Uh, once again, small files use the minimum of one disk sector, and it doubled the throughput and got rid of all the wasted space that we got accumulated from all those other changes that we had made. So roll forward the clock to 2013, and uh, I was actually at FAST, the File and Storage System Technology Conference that gets run every year by Usenix. Uh, for anyone that's into file systems, this is the conference for you. It's all file systems all the time. There's not a single paper that's not interesting. Uh, so anyway, uh, these folks had done a, a talk about uh, what they called FAST FSCK. Uh, and the thing with FSCK is it has to read all the metadata. So they just concentrated all the metadata in one place so that FSCK could just go blop, pick it up, and uh, didn't have to seek all over the disk to get inodes and indirect blocks and directories and all that. Uh, now, they had done this in the context of Linux, and they'd had to change the on-disk format because they'd done some sort of crazy stuff. Uh, but they showed that it was a good idea to do it, and they could make FSCK run faster. And uh, so I said, well, that, that's great. But I can implement that, implement that in as a policy change. Uh, and that is, I'll just take the first 4% of each cylinder group and um, hold it in reserve. I'll only, I'll only ask to allocate metadata in that area, and then I'll put all the data in the rest of the cylinder group. And of course, if you run out of that, you know, you can f you'll spill over into the data area, or you run, run out of data area, you can spill into the metadata area. So it's just a policy after all. 
So I implemented the entire thing over lunch at the first lunch of this conference and had it running uh, later that day and said, yeah, that's a great idea, and dropped it into the system, and we've had it ever since. Uh, now, the main thing that they were doing it for was to make up a CK run faster, which wasn't really much of a con uh, is issue for us, but it also makes random access to files quicker because all of the indirect blocks are all in contiguously laid out in one place. Uh, and typically, it fits on a track of a disk. And so since you have a track cache, the first time you hit metadata, uh, it just goes and pulls the track in. And now anytime you need metadata, it just, it's right there. It's available at you know, the cost of going down and asking for it, and it comes right back to you. So even if you're doing random access on a big file, it's you know, the only cost you have is the seeking around to get the data. You don't have to keep running around to, to grab metadata. Uh, so it, it speeds that up uh, quite dramatically. Also, tree traversal, if you do a find, it runs blindingly fast because all the directory information, the directory contents, the directory inode, and any indirect blocks are all in one place. So it just and goes zipping right on through. Uh, so it about doubled the speed at which we could do find from slash. Uh, and uh, as I say, it, it speeds things up mostly because the metadata ends up all in the track cache. Uh, it speeds up FSCK because there's less seeking that's needed. So on those occasions when you just, you know, you can't think of anything better to do and you want to run FSCK, you'll have to think of other things to do more quickly. Um, because it's advisory, we don't have this thing where the problems they had, which was if they ran out, then they had all these problems and they had to change the format of the disk. So of course they never got it into Linux because who's going to change the format of the disk? Uh, and it's on a per cylinder group basis. So, you know, one cylinder group may overflow, but all the others don't. Uh, so, you know, it just, it, it works really well. Okay, so of course, you know, what else is there left to do, right? Everything's been done. Well, uh, some other things that I thought about doing, there's, when you're, when you're doing trimming, so you're running on top of a flash drive, uh, you turn on the thing that says, well, when you deallocate a block, send a trim request down so that the flash drive knows the block isn't being used anymore. Well, when you unlink a file, what ends up happening is it you know, walks through freeing up the blocks, putting them back in the bitmaps to say they're available, and each block that you free sends a trim request down. So when you delete a big file, you go whoop, and you send you know, a couple thousand trim requests down to the flash drive. Well, it turns out trim request is about the slowest possible thing you can ask a trim drive to do. Read, let's say read is cost, unit cost one. That makes write about unit cost 10 and a trim is about unit cost 100. And the drive has a queue of things it can do, but what happens is that the trim requests just overflow the queue. And so the entire queue of things for the flash drive is all trim requests. And now if a read or a write comes in, it can be seconds before it gets responded to because it, it has to chew through all these trim requests before it finally has room in its queue to get a read or a write put in. So this is a disaster. Uh, so when you're deleting a file, especially when it's contiguous, uh, it, you, you could just send one trim request saying, starting here and going for two megabytes, trim that. Uh, and you could just send a single trim down. So that needs to get done. Uh, if you were over in Warner's talk at the same time as mine, uh, he's doing a bunch of stuff to, in the I.O. scheduling to first of all throttle trim requests so you don't overflow the queue with trim requests, and also to do some coalescing. So, uh, he may solve the problem for me, and I don't have to deal with it. And that would also solve it for all other file systems that go through Geom, which is all of them. Uh, the, uh, at the moment, you can't do snapshots while you're doing journal soft updates, uh, and the problem is because the journal, the, the journal recovery doesn't know how to keep the snapshots up to date. Uh, so we could either take that logic out of the kernel and put it into FSCK, uh, we, could carry, we could just say, anytime you have a crash, we'll just throw away any snapshots you had. Uh, at this point, it seems kind of pointless to me because if you want snapshots, you should just run CFS. Uh, SMR drives, bad idea, but all right, we're stuck with them. Uh, the whole thing was, well, you know, it's going to give us so much more capacity on the drive. Well, you know how much more capacity you get? If you're lucky, 20% more. And for that, you get, you know, all the fun of, of flash drive types of issues. Um, but, all right, seems to be what they're going to do for a while, so what can we do to make FS, or to make the fast file system work better? We could organize the 
the, the bitmap and have a bitmap of the things that are the part of the disk that you can do random access to, and another bitmap for things that are the, the, the areas of the disk that have to be done sequentially, and uh, then we could try and allocate the, you know, the big contiguous data areas in the parts that have to be written sequentially, and all the metadata could go into the area uh, that is read-writable. Uh, we could also stage soft update completions to, to batch things uh, so that they would flush uh, more contiguously. Um, it, it's not clear to me at this point whether it's worth doing this because the drives themselves, just like flash drives, are capable of making it look like you have complete read-write access or random access, doing it pretty much the same way flash drives do. Flash drives, so microcode, although it used to be really horrendous, is now merely bad and hopefully the same will be true of SMR and we don't really have to deal with it at the file system level. Uh, finally, a project that I think is important and one that uh, is also being driven in part by Netflix because they use UFS so heavily, and that's file system hardening. Uh, we'd like to turn unrecoverable write errors into a forced downgrade to read only on the file system instead of crashing, uh, and turn panics into a forcible unmount. Now, of course, if the thing you're forcibly unmounting is slashed, that's not going to really help you all that much. But uh, you know, if it's some peripheral file system uh, that is just going to essentially remove some of the data that you have access to um, rather than panicking and taking down the system. So um, as I say, there's actually some active work going on on this. And, and since UFS is tending to be used in these places where hardening would be helpful, I, I think that's, at this point, the most useful thing that we can do. Uh, and then there's, you know, always, well, you're going to do UFS 3. Uh, in UFS 2 and, or, you know, 1 and 2, we have 32-bit uh, inode numbers. Uh, we're, you know, who knew that people were going to want to have more than, you know, 4 billion files in a file system? Uh, my, again, my attitude is if you've got 4 billion files, you probably should be running ZFS. But nevertheless, uh, if, you, if you need that in UFS, we should probably be able to provide it. Uh, the link count should go from 16 to 32 bits because there actually are places where that turns into a problem. Uh, the current one has a provision for a dynamic block size, so on a per inode basis you can have larger blocks. Um, that is only very sketchily implemented and that could be filled out. Um, and that would be something that would probably get done in this context. And the, in the FreeBSD version, the UFS does not have endian independence. So if you're on a little endian machine, Everything's a little endian, and if you try and put that on a big endian machine, you're not going to be able to do it. Um, NetBSD has, of course, fixed this. They, they have endian independence in their UFS. Uh, it hasn't been imported over, but it's another thing that sort of would be useful, uh, particularly given the fact that endian doesn't seem to be going away. We continue to have different endians on you know, common architectures today, and uh, it would be nice to be able to have the file system a little more mobile. So with that, I will take any questions. Yeah. What would I have optimized earlier? Well, some of the things that I had on that previous slide, like and I don't know, when I went from UFS 1 to 2, why I didn't go to 32-bit uh, link counts, because that was just so obvious at the time, I should clearly have done that. Uh, the 64-bit I know that number, I knew at the time we needed to do, but it meant that all of the, the directory stuff would have had to have been changed, and I was trying to get things, you know, minimize the footprint of the change, um, but I wished I'd done that. And the last thing was that I had prepared to at least export 64-bit inode numbers out you know, through STAT and other things. Uh, I didn't do it then, and it's turned into this huge political brouhaha uh, that, and, I mean, just to give you an idea of, you know, the minutia that people argue about now, there is no way of versioning sys controls, and inode numbers and devs and things show up in sys controls, and therefore you're just going to break certain sys controls. I mean, they're the set of them that you break are these obscure things that's used by like one application, but some other application might depend on it, and so it's just, and you know, there's various ways that we could version it, but it, you know, it's just, 
there's no perfect solution, and since there's no perfect solution, we're paralyzed and have been unable for four years to get this put in. Uh, so I wished I'd just done it then when I, you know, I still had grand omnipotent high stomper and just could have done it and, you know, let people scream. Uh, it's, uh, I guess one of the other things, which isn't really file system related, but I wished long ago we had done, and that is uh, back in 4.2 days, so, you know, roll back to the early 80s, uh, IOCTL, the, the garbage can system call. Uh, when we were doing the networking, we did get and set sock op, which is a pointer to a structure and a size of it, and it's opaque, and it can just be whatever size you need, and it comes in and it goes out. And I said, you know, this sys control thing is crazy. Why don't we just, instead of setting a separate thing for the networking, let's just change IOCTL to be like set, get and set sock opt. And Bill was like, oh, no, they, you know, there's too many people that know about IOCTL. You know, there'd be 200 sites that would have to change things. Like, you know, I wish we had just done that. The other one that I regret from long ago was when we were going from NCP uh, networking to TCP IP. Uh, and NCP had had 8-bit addresses. And we were going to, to, to TCP IP, and the debate was how big an address should we have in IP. And the, the people that really knew networking was Xerox Park at that time, and they had, they had their original Ethernet, their 3 megabit Ethernet had 8-bit station addresses, and when they went to the 10 megabit, they revised it, and they went to 48-bit addresses. And XNS used 48-bit addresses. I said, look, these people know what they're doing. Why don't we go, we propose that IP should have 48-bit addresses. Oh, think of all the extra overhead. Every packet's going to have four extra bytes in it, you know, of zeros, you know, and over our 56K backbones, you know, they had all these reasons. So the debate went wildly back and forth, whether it should be 32 or 48. And in the end, we didn't hold firm and make it 48. And we wouldn't be having, struggling for 20 years with IPv6, I think, if we had done that. So, you know, people are like, oh, I'd put an E on Creat. No, no, I'd put 48 bits into IPv4. Okay, you can see I, I stick to file systems with all asked questions. Yes. So kind of a duel to the last question. Uh, are there any features you put in that in hindsight weren't worth the effort? Or what should I do? Uh, so <laughs> yes and no to that one. Um, when, when I was first doing the file system, uh, we proposed several new system calls. So uh, two of them were MakeDir and RemDir. Up to that point, the way the make their utility worked was it just created a hard link dot dot, which was this, and dot, which was that, and so on. I said, well, we should, this should just be an atomic operation. You just should, make there should be a system call, and remdir similarly. Uh, and then the third one I added was rename. So we had this advisory committee, and uh, there were, you know, lots of luminaries on this to tell these upstarts from Berkeley how we ought to do things. At the time, it seemed like we were being dictated to, but in the end, it turned out that it was good to have them there. Uh, so Dennis Ritchie was one of the people there, and he had done some of the file system stuff. So he said, all right, make there and rem there. I buy that, but now I want to talk to you about this rename thing. Uh, is this rename you're only going to allow, like, renaming something within a directory? And I said, well, no, it's, you know, completely general. You know, you can move it from here to there. He said, all right, well, so you can move a file from here to there. Are you going to allow a directory to be moved from here to there? I'm like, oh, of course, you know, I mean, you know, what do you expect? This is what it needs to do. He goes, you should think about that. That's going to be tough. And boy, was he right. <laughs> if you ever have to implement rename, run screaming from the room. Find someone else. Make it their problem. So I got it. I have fixed it at least 12 times that I can remember. Uh, so just a, a typical example. Uh, we uh, used to take the machines down at night to do dumps. And uh, so the dumper would take it down, I think it was at 1 a.m., and then would run FSCK to make sure the file system was consistent, and then would dump it. And I get this phone call, because I was, you know, he'd been running FSCK, and it wasn't terminating. And, you know, I thought, oh, great, you called me at 1 o'clock in the morning to tell me FSCK isn't terminating. What file system is it? You know, he probably just doesn't know that, you know, it takes like 10 minutes. He goes, oh, the root file system. And I said, how long has it been running? He said, oh, about 20 minutes. Oh. Okay. So I walk into campus and, you know, 
in those days, we didn't have the tools we had today, so uh, you, would, you would stop FSCK, and then you could make t a program that would take a core dump, and you could look at it and sort of see where it was, and so you took several snapshots. And it was in the phase where uh, it had traversed the tree and hadn't found all the inodes, so it would pick up one of the inodes that it hadn't found, and if it was a directory, it would go to dot dot to sort of see where it had supposedly been connected. And it was like A, B, C, and so, you know, it found C, and C was in B, and, and B was in A, and A was in C, and C was in B, and B was in A. <laughs> like, huh, that's kind of weird. Uh, so I, uh, I took out the, the stone hammer, clear eye, and went bam, and got rid of A. And then it, B was now the top, and it put that in, lost and found. And then there was D, E, and F that were also in this loop. And like, all right, this is crazy. Uh, so after I'd done this about three or four times, and there were yet more of these things, I finally changed the algorithm in FSCK. If you're looking for the top, and you've walked through the number of inodes that exist in this file system, this is the top. Just put it in a lost and found. <laughs> and it found about 10 more of these things. And uh, so, of course, then, you know, bring the system up. With great interest, I go into lost and found to see who owns these directories. And who would guess my two favorite undergraduate hackers, uh, who, of course, being only 3 o'clock in the morning, are still up. So I go up to their area where they are, and I say, oh, Professor McCusick, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, so unexpected to see you. <laughs> and I said, yes, uh, is there anything about the file system you'd like to tell me about? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I said, well, I found all these directories in circles that were disconnected from the tree that are owned by you. Would you have any idea where those could have come from? Oh, those, they said. We well, had a thing in Message of the Day saying you had this new system called Rename, so we decided to try it. So we made A, B, C, and then we went down into C and said, well, rename A to be my, you know, below me. So we reached up and went, put it there. <laughs> but then we couldn't get out of it, so we just CD'd back to Slash, and then we couldn't find it. So we tried it again to see if we could figure out what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> And then I told one of my, you know, my buddy here, and he tried it too, I guess. <laughs> OK, so this means in rename, you need to walk all the way up and see if the thing you're renaming is above you in the tree. And if it is, then that's E in Val. OK, it's only another you know, 150 lines to add to the 400 that are already in rename. Repeat for 12 or 11 more times of things of this sort that get found. At this point, I am absolutely certain there is nothing wrong with rename, because I haven't had to fix it for at least three years <coughs> that I know of at the moment. Okay. Um, I am way past time, so thank you all.